Hello everybody, this is James Chai, RFRF Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit. I am broadcasting on a Friday. Today is October 11th, 2019. This is episode number nine, uh, 17. And um, some of the topics we're going to go over on today is question uh, the other dog owner, viewers and members questions, uh, viewers who are watching this uh, during live broadcast, as well as members who are in my group, uh, Reactive Dog. Dog, and we're asking questions about dogs a bit more detailed in that information and we'll go over that and then just also uh, discussing about poor understanding of skittish dog behavior is another thing um, if you are online and you have asked me a question and that I said I was going to talk about tonight please uh, make it apparent that you are here um, just so I know and then when I uh, get to your question I will ask to see if you're online again if you're not online I'm not answering the question and I'll just uh, have to move on to the next person unfortunately because um, that and I'm gonna kind of keep it a bit short. Yesterday I was almost two hours on this, and um, it's pretty tiring. Actually, I ended up falling asleep on the table. Then I woke up two hours later. Then I went and tried to wake up and laid on the couch, and I fell asleep again. Hey, Sarah. All right, right on. Okay, cool. And I apologize. You know, um, I know you're three hours ahead, Sarah. And uh, I, I haven't had a chance to read your post uh, uh, like fully, but we'll do it online. Well, I'll read it through, and then we'll I'll go. Uh, uh, paragraph by paragraph, which is another reason why I do that. Um, uh, any of those of you who are uh, watching um, my uh, my live broadcast, um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And if you can also subscribe to my YouTube channel. I know you already have, Sarah. You've done a lot of that stuff. You've done everything I've asked, subscribed, and, and I see you following me on Instagram. Thank you so much. Uh, for other people who are benefiting from any of this, please, again, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter, the, the links are in my description. Everything helps, it allows me to uh, feel uh, that there are more people that are wanting to know what I'm doing and when that ends up happening then I feel like okay I want to have more and more detailed information being provided out to the public so that way they can learn what is going on, what is happening, how to work with dogs, how to work with the most, <laughs> uh, how to work with the most extremely dangerous dogs uh, without medication, without treats, uh, things that uh, behaviors such as Dr. Rebecca Ledger, who's an internationally known behaviorist, uh, local behaviors here as well, Dr. Claudia Richter, who say things like this are absolutely impossible to do, uh, but they have a 60%, maybe a 50% success rate with dogs that are reactive. I'm just going to turn this off. It's, uh, it's uh, somewhere over the rainbow. Um, uh, those behaviors, Dr. Uh, Ledger, Dr. Uh, Richter, uh, neither one of them are able to work with dogs uh, above uh, even a, a level, uh, bite level six dog. They're not able to work with dogs past uh, my vid scale of five. Uh, and even when those guys do it, or those uh, PhD uh, behaviors do it, they are doing it with treats, medication, so forth. Everything I do, unbelievably, but truthfully, has been done without medication or treats. You can see the newspaper articles, uh, major news coverage, national television on what I've done. And it is a very simple work that I'm doing. And it is as intuitive as we all have inside of us. The intuition comes from our instinct evolved over a gazillion years. And yes, there is a number of gazillion if you're three years old. And I'm three years old sometimes. Um, but it is our instinct, our intuition. And like anybody who was watching my live broadcast yesterday that, like I said, went to almost two hours. Uh, you, see, you would have seen me towards the last 20, 30 minutes of that live broadcast. You would have seen me reading... Uh, Matt Chun's uh, uh, video in real time with everybody, picking up everything in regards to the dog's cognitive reasoning process, the way he's able to randomize trick training as well, uh, the, his dog's behavior, behavior etc. Just by watching. And it's the same thing that we do when, you know, if you're with your loved one, you know how to finish his sentences. If you are watching, you know, I'm just Saying it to Sarah, right? You, you you have the intuition already inside of you. So this is what we're doing: is we're addressing things on an intuitive level. Nowhere in the entire canine species is food used as a communication device. Talk to Dr. Ledger. Talk to Dr. Richter. Talk to uh, uh, what is it? Karen Pryor. Talk to Temple Grandin. Talk to Ian, Dr. Ian Dunbar. Not a single one of them can refute this fact. Nowhere in the entire canine. Uh, I'll have to answer the questions in a bit, uh, Sarah, please. Um, nowhere in the entire American species does food exist as a communication device. They don't. Dogs don't use treats to, to, to reward each other. The basis on the intuitive aspect, and when the dog is processing triggers and processing reacting at one-tenth of a second, 
again we talked about I talked about abstract memory and the and the way the dog processes slivers of frame of, of vision uh, which is much more further detailed um, what ends up happening is the dog is reacting that that capacity nowhere does food exist it is an anthropomorph anthropomorphization of our human expectation of compliance we have somebody working for us we want them to work better we give them a better wage uh, we want to make them feel good we give them a bonus and as human beings we're like, oh yeah yeah right it's our superficiality and our lack of connection to uh, the visceral aspects of ourselves but we all have it inside of us when you meet somebody for the first time you know you're gonna eat the best friends or you're not gonna like them at all it's just normal that happens I'm just clearing up my screen here um, uh, but you know right away are you friends or are you not going to be friends? Do you want to buy a car from this person or you don't want to, right? Uh, it, it is really that thing. Say, for example, you're just walking down the street and some guy comes up to you and goes, hey, man, uh, can I borrow 20 bucks? And you're like, no way. But if your friend asks you, there it is. Then you'll say, yeah, I'll lend you $20. Uh, and I talked about that part before, so it's in other episodes. I don't want to rehash it. I uh, want to kind of progress our, uh, our journey together as we move forward forward what we're doing and then eventually I'll start getting to much more detailed psychological aspects as I leave my digital legacy uh, to move forward towards the functional sentience of dogs and when I talk about more of a detailed psychology of what's going on this is beyond anything academia has ever been able to do as you've seen in the links that I've given you I am able to predict when a dog is going to turn his head forward and backwards and why and as I said I've had an international behaviorist who has written university textbooks just completely off no, nowhere at all. There's, there's nothing else at all. You know, Amy, this is really great that you're uh, putting that on about this part. And I know you're attending uh, the group session with Second Chance in Life Rescue, as well as um, um, I think we're uh, right. So, and you're in my closed group as well. I, I, I've got this stuff. I'm going to talk about interestingly enough in the description aspect of it. Um, but yeah, getting back to everything else, there's no food. Food doesn't exist. There's no treats. There's nothing at all. So why are trainers, behaviors, people like Dr. Ledger, who's got a newspaper column, and I'm not trying to be sour on her. I've just seen all the dogs that have come through her, um, that people hire me as uh, after going to her, and they're just like, wow, we didn't even know this existed about dogs. Yesterday, um, I had a client, a really nice person, phenomenal, and she'd seen all my, you know, she's been watching my stuff, and she's like, okay, you know what? I, I like what you do, and it's visceral, and... Um, what's really interesting is that I told her every time I talk to anybody, I give you a lot of information. I don't try to, to, to spread it out over two sessions, three sessions, five sessions, 10 sessions, just to drag you in for the money. And I charge $230 a session. What I do though, is I give you as much information upfront in the beginning. So you have a full comprehensive psychological understanding of your dog. And then you go from there. And then if you ever have a question, like anybody like Deborah uh, with Leo, if you're there, Deborah, hi, Deborah, uh, you'll see that everything, if you have a problem, like tonight, Deborah had a problem. I phoned her up. Otto with her, with his dog, Derby, had a problem the other day, phoned him up. Talked for like 20 minutes, an hour. There's no charge on that because in my case is I'm not just grateful for you trusting my work. And, and regardless if it's, regardless if I've been considered the best in North America with extremely dangerous dogs, doesn't matter about the media coverage. It's the fact that you yourself trust me and that's loyalty. And the loyalty that you have for your dog and the love and the friendship that you have for your dog, I feel the same way. When I meet your dog, I fall in love with your dog in the visceral sense of it. And that's why I can understand the intuitive aspects of their psychology. You have a rare gift with dogs, and, and even Otto has said, you know, James said he can read dogs at two-tenths of a second, hired him to see if he really could, and in one of his screenshots that I'm going to post up in my uh, website, rfrfbarkbark.com, under help for your dogs, he says, James reads dogs at two-tenths of a second. Otto, thank you so much for that part. Um, there, there is just a lot of aspects of human nature that we have just abdicated. We have just abandoned in our superficial, technologically driven world. Um, so that's a little bit of my, uh, my thing about it is just get back to holding hands again and do that with your dog. Just connect to your dog again, start talking to them conversationally and you get that connection. Uh, Deborah with Leo tonight, she said to me, hey, you know what? She's not using high pitched tone anymore and talking like that and disingenuous aspects to her dog anymore. She's talking in regular tones and she is saying that she's feeling better herself inside because she's not feeling stress anymore. And whenever there's a situation, she goes back to square one when it's necessary. And then she was talking about uh, how Leo, uh, when she would 
God, Darnell's kind of skittish and, and, and a little reactive. He's, a, he, he's been attacked three times by a dog, and, and the other day, actually, he was almost attacked again uh, by a German Shepherd, and she was able to reset him. But she said that um, she was going out her door, and at night, he gets reactive still. So whenever she goes to reach and lock the door, and he'll start barking and barking, right? And just and I, I told her why the anxiety. It's not it's anxiety, but more deeper on that is the issue of other parts of, of the uh, definitive explanation that I gave her. And then we were talking a little bit more. She go, and I was going to say a couple of things. And then one thing she said, well, maybe I should go and do this and this. And I was thinking about that. I said, that's exactly what I was going to say. And she's like, oh, cool. I thought so. I said, that's right. That's your intuition. Use your intuition. Embrace that. How many times have you have you thought you should do something and you really should do it? And you went, oh, no, I better not do it. And then the next day you find out, oh, I should have done it because I was right intuition but we've learned to self-doubt we've learned recrimination we've learned uh, prejudice from other people we've learned the the bullying the the uh, lots of aspects of the obtuse personalities of people outside of us who say don't do this don't trust your your intuition uh, be silly you know dogs are overt codependent so they love us they're, they're, they're happy to show it in the world right Human beings were covert codependent, right? And we don't want, oh, don't, oh, don't want to show that we love somebody. I'm kind of crazy like that. I love showing how much I love somebody, you know, public displays of affection, that kind of stuff. That's what your dog is. Not that I'm a dog like that, but that's what it is. Our freedom and our ability to cohabitate and to enjoy ourselves um, and to go from there. Uh, like I said, is when we get a little bit deeper into this relationship and you guys go through my journey. And I know people are saying, how are you keeping up these vlogs every we always have something to talk about because that's how much stuff there is to talk about. It took me over 1,400 days, over 20,000 hours working alone with predatory dogs, giant dogs, 150, 180 pounds. I learned this. If I didn't learn it, I would literally be dead. I've got some scars on me. People have seen the scars and all that stuff. Who cares? Not a big deal. I, it happens, right? I always say to people, if something happens, don't react because it doesn't help. How did I learn that? Because one time I went and saw um, a dog named Milo that belonged to uh, a publicist and an and a actor, uh, acting teacher, known acting teacher here. And um, their dog got away from them. And when the dog got away from them, in their, they, they told me to come up to their uh, their condo and all that stuff. As opposed to normally, I was just thinking I should just meet him outside. But I was like, because I knew the, the acting teacher. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll come upstairs. Even though I shouldn't have. My intuition... And uh, I didn't trust myself, so I went upstairs and met with him, and their dog got away from them, and actually, and he's a, he's probably, he's a smaller dog, so he's like about 60 pounds, and he got away from them, and he got behind, and as I tried to kind of move away, because I could tell he was coming behind me, as he was t running towards me, I tried to get behind, uh, against the wall, and he switched his uh, 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 sides, and again, his, unfortunately, his owner let go, or something happened, I don't remember, well, they just didn't have a proper hold on him. Um, and then he got behind me and he bit me in the back of the leg and it was about a one inch by one inch, uh, uh, um, uh, wound, um, you know, and I started actually yelling and this happened about two years ago. I started like, ow, 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 ow. And then after I realized, I went, the dog doesn't care. I, it doesn't do anything. And on top of it, it just further contributes to the dog's belief that what he's doing is effective. So uh, other people have seen me since then, <laughs> like, you know, I've been bitten, it's like, whatever. I mean, if it hurts, I'm going to yell in pain, but I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, it, it's really no use, right? You see people in a, at a park, dog park, and the dogs start fighting, and everyone's yelling, right? And it's like, what's the use of yelling? And then there's the one person that comes up, man or woman, comes up and up to the dog's fighting and goes, stop it! And the dog just stop, like, what the heck, Right? There's no use, right? You just be efficient while you talk. It's just the yelling just contributes to it. All right. Um. So uh, yeah. So there's links to my YouTube channel. I'm gonna keep going on there because I don't want to run out of time tonight. Uh, I've got a group session tomorrow for uh, uh through my rescue for skittish dogs. Um. And then I also have uh, uh my uh, uh donations uh if uh, for Patreon and GoFundMe and the money raised will go to pay for sessions for people who are on fixed incomes. And those people on fixed incomes will be able to work with their dogs without the cost of anything because it's being supported by my donors in this as well. I will be doing whatever I can to um, kind of change the world and make the world look at things a bit different. Um, so tonight's uh, live broadcast uh, broadcast pre-notes, uh, I'll, 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 you know, afterwards I'll go through it all and I'll put the keynotes and all that. 
but just the five little topics, six little topics I'm going to go over, and then we'll get to the questions, uh, comments from the viewers that I haven't caught up to, and then actual dog behavioral issues uh, such as Sarah has uh, in regards to those who have come to my closed group. Uh, like I said, anyone can join it. Uh, go to rfarfbarkbark.com. The link is in my description uh, part. And then you can ask a question, post and clear photos of your dog, watch, uh, read the other people's photo, uh, other posts, and then you have an idea how to uh, phrase it. Um, I get a lot of people who contact me through through social media, and they say, "Hey, can I can I get uh, no, Deborah? I'm live." Um, they they'll say to me, "Hey, can I get some help? This is the issue with my dog. I've seen your videos, yada yada." And I'll say, "Okay, well, you got to go to my group uh, and and post it because of two reasons. One, then it's formalized and it's in proper, uh, concise, clear, uh, paragraphical format. Additionally to that, then it is." The benefit of being my group and there's no cost to these people and you'll see some of the testimonials and screenshots 100 percent accuracy that i'm doing and that is a huge number uh, uh, that like i say uh, dr ledger dr richter 60 percent at the most probably about 50 percent success rate i've got the evaluation report from dr ledger that a, a client sent to me who referred to a dog that had a uh, prey drive right well, whatever i'm just going to say whatever she calls it um prey drive and her recommendation, Dr. Ledger's recommendation was either to rehome the dog or kill the dog. That's that's caught playing both sides of the field, right? It's a uh, it's a certain inability to be definitive because of the legal protections that one is trying to do when one is not aware or, or cognizant or proficient in what they're doing. And, um, and then unfortunately, like I was just talking to somebody tonight about it, unfortunately, those people at the top maintain that type of perspective. And then that gets diluted, not diluted, but I mean, it gets infused like the Kool-Aid into the rest of society. And that's why we are killing 6 million dogs annually, for primarily for behavioral issues in North America. 99.4 million dogs, 2018, North America. So 6% kill rate is statistically low, but it is uh, fundamentally uh, disgusting. And um, I'm getting people like Lori Wingard, who was supposed to uh, do and, and be. Uh, I, I'm just in a not in a great mood today. I just uh, I think it's just because, uh, and I'll get to this later on in a bit. But it just this this callousness of humanity um, is depressing. It's really quite sad and it's depressing. And and people are killing their dogs. Um, but I'll get to the point, and then we'll we'll get to that. And let me just take a sip of water here. Okay. Uh, first one is reactionary and consequential. The second uh, point, uh, uh, pre-note, is uh, understanding the nuances of your dog and the other dog. It, uh, the third one is if you're not sure, question the approaching owner, which you probably already know. Uh, the next one is if the rescue org sends you, you to a treat trainer for your skittish dog. right? And then again, uh, the next one is poor understanding of skittish dog behavior. The next note I have down there is about the upcoming documentary Dog War, and it's discussed on the Stop Yulin, uh, Yulin, Stop Yulin podcast on YouTube. The link is in there uh, in my description, and it is about the uh, meat dog trade. Uh, I hate to say that. It's a, it, it lends legitimacy somewhat to that. That's happening in Asia, where approximately 30 to 40 million dogs are killed uh, for food, and these are people who are stealing dog uh the meat dog trade and so forth it's a representation of low education it's an ignorant aspect there's a lot of peasant type mentality that happens people are not emotionally sophisticated and who believe in witchcraft basically so it's like a um, an entire uh, continent of ignorance but it's not limited to there as well it happens in africa where they do similar aspects of it and countries like Iran, Iraq, uh, Turkey, so forth, Romania, where the cruelty is abject and when it comes to dogs. It's uh, brutal. And, and some of these countries, I'm going to get graphic, so cover your ears. Cover your ears. I'm going to hold my hand up when I say this, so it's going to be graphic. So cover your ears. Last warning. In countries like Romania and Turkey, uh, Iran, they will actually uh, catch pull these dogs that are strays, and then they will ble uh, inject them with bleach. And then they just let them go. That's human cruelty. Uh, in China and Asia, they'll beat those dogs alive. Uh, the, this uh, documentary, uh, Dog War, uh, talks about it. There are some graphic discussions on it. Um, it is the first uh, uh, episode on Stop Yulin podcast on there. So uh, go ahead and take a look. Do a like. 
tell them that you saw me on that uh, that you, that I mentioned it on on the thing uh, on my vlog tonight. Let them know that hey, I saw James Chai on it, and he mentioned about Dog War and this uh, podcast. They're also interviewing other uh, other uh, known international organizations such as uh, Dual Duo Project, uh, Plush Bear uh, Shelter in China. It's a well-known one there. Um, uh, Vanderpump Dogs, uh, you know, Lisa Vanderpump and all that stuff. Uh, John Sessler is the executive director of it. Uh, they will be interviewing, um, who else is there? Um, I think she's trying to get Animals Asia in it as well. Uh, Jade is the person who's running it. And uh, I think Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, which uh, uh, I won't get into that right now. And I'm also very, uh, very honored to be one of the guests that are interviewed on, on this show as well. So I'll be uh, posting that when that happens. But uh, I'm just upset because, uh, again, you know, I know it happens. This is where I actually started becoming publicly known uh, back in 2015 and 2016 when I started um, being aware of this uh, disgusting uh, filth of humanity. And um, I started calling out a lot of organizations that were profiting off the misery of dogs. And so it sort of brings back these... Uh, these um, uh, uh, horrific memories and um, uh, anyhow uh, I'm just gonna go progress from that so the uh, dog war is is being uh, being produced there and um, oh shoot I forgot to um, um, okay uh, Andy is the guy uh, the director on it uh, uh, unfortunately I don't remember his last name now just get a little bit of a blank but uh, the GoFundMe is up there. Uh, let me just see if I can get this GoFundMe so I can just tell you who this uh, Andy is. Uh, he's He's been nominated 10 times. He's won eight awards. Um, he's an uh, Emmy, Emmy Award winning uh, director. Um, so it's pretty cool. He's gone in there. And uh, from the description of this episode, he has um, uh, this film that he's, uh, he's producing. Uh, what he is doing is uh, Andy Abrams Wilson uh, from Open Eye Pictures Inc. Seems like a phenomenally uh, uh, super focused man in the sense that this is what he's doing i mean he's a vegetarian uh, you know in that sense of it i don't eat meat either um and he's focusing on on trying to raise funds to complete this project he's obviously spent quite a few hundred thousand dollars on it already and he's just trying to close the project but uh he was interviewed uh the first podcast in regards to this so this is something that's quite um uh, it's upsetting because it happens hi sue um so we're going to do that, and then after that, we'll get to the members' questions and all that stuff. And I'm going to just, uh, because Sarah's up there, and it's probably 12 o'clock midnight now, Sarah, so I'm, I'm going to get to that uh, in about 15, 20 minutes, after, well, maybe half an hour, because it kind of roll on a bit. I'll get to all that stuff. Okay, so I'm going to get to the points about uh, first key, uh, first uh, pre-note regards to reactionary and consequential. And that's identifying. And so this is what I'm saying. We're talking about trainers who are talking like, you know, your dog's aggress, your dog is uh, territorial, your dog is resource guarding, your dog is fearful, your dog is skittish. But we want to understand what's more. And, and and the other interesting thing is, I just want to kind of say this is kind of cool. I know there's a certain couple of trolls here that are watching me and learning off of me, which is uh, funny because I'm hearing it from your friends now. So it's funny that it's ironic that you would troll me and then you're watching my episodes to learn from what I'm saying, even though you publicly criticize me and criticize me all. So the hypocrisy is disgusting. Uh, but you know what? If you're learning from me, that means I'm winning. Haha. <laughs> okay. So anyways, not that I really care about that part. I just want to say the hypocrisy is disgusting. Um, okay, so reactionary and consequential are aspects of dog's behavior, right? Yesterday I was talking about premeditation and uh, consequential behavior when it comes to humans and animals. Talk about the emotional isomorphism of human and animal, um, human and dog uh, cohabitation over the 10,000 plus years that we've been together, all these aspects of it. We want to talk about the way the dog is reacting to their environment. So a lot of Sometimes, like I said, it's a consequential behavior that's happening. That consequential behavior is reactionary. Sometimes, sometimes it's just because a dog is not feeling great. You know, a skittish dog is not going to be enjoying themselves being outside because, of course, they're not used to it because maybe they came from a dog meat farm, a dog farm, should I say, or they, they're a stray dog and they've been uh, subjected to human beings who are trying to kill them as well. Like I said, you know, what happens with those other uh, uh, peasant type countries. Um, so it's the part of what is your dog doing? Is your dog reacting to the environment consequentially or is your dog reacting to the environment reactionary as in, you know, the domino effect? And this is where the uh, misunderstanding by trainers and behaviors are saying the, the silly term of trigger stacking or flooding. It's not. The dog's just reacting to the circumstances. The dog has a high tolerance of behavior. 
So we're needing to understand what's happening on that part. So uh, consequential, again, would be a situation, for example, um, if you're walking with your dog and another dog comes up and starts like, you know, lunging at your dog right away. Your dog is normally walking and the other dog just comes right up right away, right? Which is what uh, Deborah had talked to me about today. That's, that's consequential. Yes, the dog is reacting, but he's reacting only consequentially. Because normally, just walking along, woof, 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 woof. Other dog, right. Consequential to it. The other dog didn't do it, he would have kept walking. So that's not reactionary. Reactionary is going to be in the aspect where the dog is initiating the point of it due to the stimulation that he's not able to process through. Uh, or she is not able to process through. So she becomes... The, the dog, your dog, becomes reactionary because they're not able to like contain themselves, contain themselves. So, for example, uh, you know, um, Deborah's walking with Leo today, and the German Shepherd comes up and starts being that. So, Leo has a choice of either reacting or just going, hmm, whatever, and keep going. So, we want to identify those aspects of the behavior on the dog. So, when you're paying attention to your dog much more often and seeing what their behavior is to other dogs walking by, uh, if your dog, again, is not reacting to things and his behavior, if he's a dysfunctional dog, low, mid, or high dysfunctional dog, or severe, or detorial in that sense, then you know it's only consequential. And when it is consequential, then it's easier to address because your dog is not set into that second tier of behavior as opposed to just being relaxed. Reactionary is going to be something where if you know your dog is reactive, which is what this other guy who had this uh, German Shepherd, if you know that dog is reactive, if you know your dog is reactive, then it's an aspect of watching your dog because you already know they're going to. You got to stop that right away. If you know it's going to happen, you got to stop it right away because you have to deal with it because they're not being consequential. They're already getting ready. They're, they're just being reactionary because they're like, okay, if I see another dog, I'm going to do this because of the behavior, the fear that's been instilled by them by either being attacked or just overall uh, uh, concern about um, um, the way you're able to protect them as well. And if they can't feel that you're protecting them, like their mom being their mom or dad, then they're going to go, okay, I got to do it myself, even if the other dog's doing nothing and is being an innocent dog. So you want to, uh, again, pay attention to that, get into the details. As I say, you follow me on this journey. We're going to start talking about these things more in specific topic lines, on and on and on. Uh, that part, again, to the next point is understanding the nuances of your dog and the other dog. Okay, so, so again, consequential reactionary. So, you know your dog's behavior. When they're at home, you know you know how they, they'll go up and they'll, they'll grab a toy and they'll start playing with a the toy. They'll start chewing on it. You already know they have a favorite toy. You know what they're going to do with that favorite toy of yours, right? They, I mean, of theirs. They're, you know their behavior. You know how they, they need to go to the bathroom. They'll either start pacing or they'll go to the door or they'll come near you or they'll start nudging you. You know the signs. That this is the behavior of your dog. It's understanding the nuances of your dog. And those behaviors that they're doing may be overt. Dog has to go to the bathroom, comes up to you, starts nosing, nosing you. That's overt. That's pretty overt. But then the other ones are, what does your dog do leading up to actually telling you that they need to go pee? Because up to the point, your dog is not going to be making any overt aspects of behaviors that have to go to the bathroom until it starts to bother them or starts to hurt them or starts to make it uncomfortable for them. You want to pay attention to that part. Right? And as I talked about in regards to the way the dog processes pain uh, through a redundant format, and like I say, follow me and we'll, we'll end up talking about the redundancy aspect. And then when you hear about it, you're just going to be like, holy cow, that makes all sense at all. And, it, and it's a huge, probably would take me two weeks worth of vlogging to talk about that because it's so detailed, all the nuances to pay attention to. Um, so again, for example, your dog's got to go pee. So you know when he's going to go pee, comes up to you, all right. So in the future, if you're aware of it, start to try to do the accident reconstruction that I talk about and start destructuring it back down to their behavior so that even when they're laying on the couch and you know they're not having to pee, you're still recognizing when they're about to need to go pee and then you move it forward, okay? So that's the nuances of your dog. Um, and just, again, I'm just talking about it because I want to get to the questions and I know that... Um, Sarah uh, doesn't want to stay up all night. Uh, and the other part is understanding the nuances of the other dog's behavior. So you talk about these uh, things where I, you know, when I, when I, you know, 
like stuff like whale eyed and, and, and all that stuff. Like I don't, when I talk to people, I don't even use those terms anymore, but then I realize I have to use those generic terms depending on what the person's saying to me. Cause if they've read a lot of stuff online or gone to trainers and they're going to get whale eyed, blah, blah, slit eyed and all that stuff, yada, yada. <laughs> it's more the fact that why is that happening? Why is that dog that's approaching your dog having this type of eye contact or this type of eye behavior, right? Behavior. Why is your dog? Why is that dog doing that? What is the dog doing? Is the dog walking away from us? As uh, if I'm walking, if the dog is walking away from me, it, 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 what is happening? Why is that dog walking away? What are the nuances? Is the dog acting towards my dog or towards me? If it's a if it's a dog reactive or male reactive or a human reactive dog, why is he trying? And what is he doing? And what I do again is by experience and learning from from experience. If there's there's a reaction from the other person's dog. What do I remember that dog doing before he did it? So that again is how you pay attention to the nuances. We can pay attention to our cell phone. And we can even remember that if we went to go click on something, but we didn't click on it and they went to another screen and went to another screen. Like, oh, wait a minute. I needed to go back to that screen for that information. It's kind of like, you know, you read a news article and the news article has like 15 or different, uh, 15 different uh, links. You know, you follow one link, then it's the next one. And you realize, wait a minute, my original link, I have to follow it back. Like a bread, well, not bread crumbs because, you know, we know what happened to Hansel and Gretel. Um, but we got to follow it back. And the only reason we follow it back is so we can get back to our our, our uh, Facebook, right? Because we follow the link off of Facebook. Should I, I should have said that. We follow the link, da, 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 da. We have to go back to be able to go back to Facebook because we don't want to have to restart Facebook again. So that's what I mean is we, we can start destruction what happened, accident reconstruction. And when you're paying attention not to your own dog, own, uh, in regards to the nuances, start paying other people's dogs as well. Don't worry about making eye contact with the human being. Who cares? Right? If you got a reactive dog or if their dog is reactive, something happens. Right? Everyone says, oh, it just happened. I, I, I don't know what happened. Well, it's because we, you weren't paying attention. When you start paying attention, like people who have dogs who are really quite reactive, they end up studying their own dog. And they know their own dog. And you see them getting ready all the time, right? Because they know their dog's going to be reactive, right? Because they're already recognizing the signs. Because they have to. Because if they don't, then their dog will be reactive and maybe it bite uh, another dog or a person and then be killed. So those people have to do it. But they're with the, you know high and, and, and predatory, well, no, because they don't have that, but they have a high or higher type uh, dysfunctional dogs, so they're paying attention. They have to. So they're already subconsciously saying it. And when you talk to people who have dogs like that, like that they're like, yeah, well, you know, we have, we, we can tell when they're going to get upset, when my dog's going to get upset, because I can tell, because you had to. So you want to do the same thing with the other people's dogs as well. Even a happy, friendly dog, right? Because a lot of times people say, yo, you know, my dogs are all great and they're all happy, but it's just one dog he doesn't like. There you go, right? So you don't want to be that one dog. Your dog, you don't want your dog to be that one dog that that dog doesn't like. So you want to pay attention to that because then you're like, oh, I catch it. So be a ninja, okay? Be a ninja. You don't even have to be Asian to be a ninja. It's free. Um, so that's what you want to do. Uh, it brings up another topic that I talked about very, very, very briefly. And that's regards when people say uh, two dogs are facing each other and they're happy and all that stuff and their tails are wagging which the tail wagging is actually uh tail behavior and that tail behavior is actually a cognitive processing is an emotional processing it's a conscious uh subconscious behavior aspect of it the tail wag how fast it is the the firmness of it the direction of it if it's a figure eight if it's a swash it's a swoosh if it's it's it, it, there's so much if you saw what i saw and there's actually one that i uh have with uh bruno the saint bernard and you can see his tail behavior on that. And I mentioned that. And I'll try to get the link when I go through. And I'll put it in. And you can watch the Bruno video. And you'll see his tail behavior. And actually, I talk quite a bit about that, which will give people a little bit more information in regards to his tail behavior and to his tongue as well. If the dog licks in the front, to the side, to the right, and all that kind of stuff is indicative of processing aspects of it on either emotional or cognitive processing. And I'm 100% right. Because if I'm not 100% right, the predatorial giants would have killed me a long time ago. The same dogs that everyone else says, people like Ledger says, eh, you can't fix them, you got to kill them. I'm their 
in the trenches alone by myself, wondering if I do get attacked, will I bleed out before 911 arrives? Will I bleed too much that I can't even dial 911 on my cell phone? Or will I even be able to get to it? Uh, I think somebody said to me the other day about, uh, oh yeah, I was talking to somebody who's up uh, up, uh, up island here on Paul River, wants to uh, uh, get me to come up there and I, it's going to be kind of expensive for him, but okay. Um, and so... Um, he says that he can't bring his dog down here because he's too afraid and he doesn't, he's too afraid to even be in the vehicle if his dog reacts. If his dog is just fine, he's totally cool. Yeah, hey, no problem. But if his dog reacts, he knows he won't be able to control his dog because his dog has attacked people a few times. This guy's actually kind of cool in the sense that he lives in a somewhat secluded area so he doesn't have to worry about his dog. But then he puts his dog downstairs and all that stuff when he needs to because if guests come over, etc. and all that. He said that... Um, and he's he's like spending a lot of money, right? Because he has a business and all stuff. But um, he said that if I surrender my dog to anybody, like the SBCA, you surrender a, a dog with behavioral issues or that needs a little bit of training for that issue, they kill the dog. Okay. And the uh, BC SBCA got thirty nine point one million dollars last year in donations, and they're still out there. I just saw a flyer here from my roommate. It's like holy cow, they're still begging for money. Um, so uh, you know, and they're not even changing the laws. The, uh, the SBCA that have quasi legislative powers here right they do animal control uh, uh, what happened to the laws against licensing uh for for licensing backyard breeders right it, it done, disappeared somehow huh weird weird uh, other aspects of, of that part anyways i just i just don't think it's cool when you have huge organizations like them oh, well big organizations like them and they're not spending the money properly and actually, Andy brought up a great point in his uh, in his interview uh, on uh, uh, Sup Yulin podcast when he talked about um, uh, the topic of HSI Humane Society International was brought up, and he talked about that in somewhat in not he was very politically correct, but I already knew what he did because back in 2015 when I started all this, uh, HSI is a affiliate subsidiary of HSUS Humane Society United States HSI Humane Society International. In 2015, because this is what I remember, 2015, HSI, not HSUS, but HSI declared in revenue to the IRS, are you ready? $411 million. They received $140 million in donations, cash donations, $210 or $220 in offshore investment accounts, because they're a nonprofit. Over ten million dollars is paid to the board of uh, their, their 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 salaries, right? Over ten million, BCSPCA pays two million. So that's what I'm saying. And BCSPCA has the Animal Kind program, which is like I said, it sounds like the Ellen DeGeneres Be Kind aspect of it. You're like talk about, anyways, whatever, right? So they're still begging out for money. They're they're killing puppy dogs. Um, BCSPCA is buying keywords so it buries that negative news about them where they killed a puppy that was less than a year old that they refused to train that just nipped the the new family's uh, uh adopters uh, pants and, and i ripped it or whatever it's kind of funny um because that's where our donations are going right we're paying for good coverage and all the negative stuff they just bury if you if you google uh disable uh no sorry uh uh um uh, bc spca or north van spca kills puppy uh, you'll find that all those key words and if you look at my previous vlog, uh, vlogs you'll see it all those keywords go to the SPCA website instead and the actual news negative news article on globalnews.ca is like on the second page now and I remember when I was looking at it about four months ago it was on the first page first listing so they they've been buying keywords that's what your donations are they're paying for their screw up and uh so if you're donating to the SPCA, you're part of the problem. It's your choice. Huh, rant. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so the next point, I mean, I just got to get back to this again. Sorry, sir. Um, uh, so if you're not able to understand the nuances of your dog, etc., uh, if you're not sure, question the approaching owner. Don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be self-conscious. If you have a reactive dog, or even if your dog's a normal dog, but you're not sure about the other dog, loudly announce in a in a calm happy voice hey is your dog good with other dogs is your good your dog good with people ask whatever you want say it with a smile so your dog doesn't feel anxious and sometimes the other person will go oh actually no no um you know my dog's not that great so uh, right that's what you want to say 
Um, you can also say things if you have a reactive dog and some of you guys have to have a muzzle on your dog. Like I said, I only deal with the dysfunctional dogs on a higher level. So if some of you walk with a dysfunctional dog with the, the muzzle on because he's reactive, might bite another dog, might bite people, etc. A lot of times people, when we see that dog with a muzzle, we're like, oh gosh, oh gosh, oh gosh, oh my gosh, it's a dangerous dog because he's got a muzzle on. And if it's a certain breed, they're like even more dangerous, right? Than the fear, people are like, ugh. So I always say to people, which is really the truth, I'm muzzle training the dog. Like I don't use muzzles, but anyways, I'm muzzle training the dog. Just tell them I'm muzzle training the dog. If your, your dog is not reactive, but skittish and doesn't like people or other dogs, I'm just leash training my dog. And then it gives you the excuse to keep walking. So you don't have to stop. And a lot of people will say, oh, you know what? You're, oh, you're muzzle training. Oh, I, I can say hi. Because then they feel safe and they go, they know you're really training your dog because you really are. Every time you're out with your dog, you're training them. Every single time you're out there, you're training them. Same thing when I'm driving my car down the highway and I'm, you know, changing lanes. I'm training myself to be alert and make sure that I don't crash. Because there's that one time when I'm not looking at my blind spot. I'm like, oh, shoot, I almost hit this car. So I'm training myself. You're doing the same thing with your dog by muzzle training them or leashing them. You're telling people and a lot of people are very generous and they'll say, oh, hey, you know, I'll say hi to them. And I talked about in a couple other uh, episodes before how to have people approach your dog so that they understand that the stability is there and that your dog is being protected at all times. Okay, so we're talking about just approaching the other owner. Always be f confident enough to, to say that my dog's not comfortable or how's your dog? Is your dog cool? That's it. Oh, good, good, good. Right? right? And, and again, sometimes people, you can see, they pretend that they're okay and they're like, oh, oh and then and you ask them like, oh, actually, my dog's not that great. I'm sorry. And then you respect each other. Your two dogs are like, whatever the two dogs are like oh okay well whatever nobody's no foul no reaction happens because another thing is if you have a reactive uh, your dog's not even reactive a lot of people this happens right a lot of times people will have their dog which is no problem at all and then another dog attacks them and then your dog becomes reactive in defensive measures insecurity unsecurity uh, uh you know uh, Confidence issues, a whole bunch of stuff, right? That's why I say skittish and all these other terms are too many generalities. You want to get to the deeper uh, breadth of it. <laughs> but then that dog that attacked, attacks your dog, who is normally nice, and then your dog becomes, over time, if it's not addressed, becomes reactive or defensive or skittish or fearful because of the behaviors on it. So it's better to just say, hey, is your dog cool? As opposed to, oh, I thought he was okay in my head, but now my dog got bit. All right, we want to be careful. Same thing like I was saying before when the two dogs are facing off each other. So I'll go into a bit more detail on that. They're facing each other and they're like, oh, they're all happy and everything like that. Tails wagging and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden there's a dog fight that happens. And what that is, is an interpretation or a misinterpretation in regards to behavioral conduct between the two of them as they're reading each other at one tenth of a second and even faster. Because again, for human beings, we're like, oh, they were just there. And then they suddenly happen. They didn't suddenly happen. All signs are there. So it's either an interpretation or misinterpretation in regards to play behavior or body behavior, nuance behavior, greeting behavior, negotiation behavior, blah, 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 right? Negotiation, all this stuff is there. It's so detailed. That's why I take everything when it comes to the predatorial dogs and it just, it's it's like grains of sand. There's so much here that I can talk about. Um, okay, so uh, the other thing is uh, I put a note down here is if the, uh, uh, hey, Jackie, uh, if the rescue org sends you to a treat trainer for your skittish dog, like there's a lot of rescues that come in, like for example, uh, a few rescues bring in dogs from Taiwan, and a lot of these Formosa Mountain dogs are skittish. Because they're stray dogs, they're running around, um, they're they're oppressed, they're sometimes homed, and then they're then they're just abandoned out on the street, and they become skittish. And uh, some of these, like the ones here locally, a, a couple of the rescue orgs, I mean, some of them were using me, and then. Um, they ended up going to treat training. They ended up referring their owners to take their dog to a treat trainer, which is kind of like, if you don't understand what's going on or if you have a personal issue with me, I get it, but why are you subjecting the dog to being further victimized? Because treat training doesn't work. Like I said earlier, nowhere in the entire canine species does treat training, does food, does com none of it's used as a communication device. So we're trying to brute force through our human arrogance that oh if the dog is nervous and scared well i'm just going to give him some food and then these rescue organizations here uh, the, there's two of them that end up sending their dogs to treat trainers it's like 
right? And they were they, one of them was using me before, and so I and I and I just found out they started referring to to this thing because she the, the the founder of that one has a personal issue with me. I just found that out tonight, and I was like, wow, that's a surprise. Um, why didn't you just talk to me about it instead of just running away? And I actually stopped uh, stopped following me and everything. I was really kind of hurt actually because I I thought you know what when I, we've talked about the health and the mental health of your dogs that you're bringing in and instead you're just going to a treat trainer now because you don't like my personal opinion about uh about stuff i'm like okay but now those dogs are the ones that are suffering because now they're going to be the ones that are um uh, are, are not being understood because the treat trainer is going to give you food to your give food to your dog which is really stupid because if you're dysfunctional if you're already nervous about something right and i've said this before as well we are passenger in a car, and the driver's an excellent driver, and as you're driving through an intersection in a green light, someone runs a red light, T-bones you, you go to the hospital, you're in there for six months, you got to learn how to walk again, you got to learn how to use your spoon again, you got to learn how to eat, you got to learn all these things again. And then six months, you're finally out of, out of the rehab, you've learned to walk, and you're back in the car, and the, and you got a different driver, or the same driver, doesn't matter, and you're driving, well, you want is probably a different driver, and then you're going through the intersection, not because of the driver's fault, but just maybe whatever anyway and you're driving and you're approaching the same intersection again because the only way to get home you're approaching the same intersection you start getting scared dysfunctional skittish afraid just like a dog and you get closer to the intersection and you're saying to the driver do we have to go through it please 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 don't 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 this is where i almost died and i was six months in the hospital and your dysfunction is getting up and you're getting more and more skittish and more and more extremely worried and more and more worried and worried and worried and then the driver hands you an ice cream cone and says here you're okay Take a treat. Next time you're fighting with somebody, having an argument with them, with your partner, hand them a treat. It'll make them even more pissed off. It'll make them say, I don't even understand why you're doing this. You don't understand me anymore. So that's why I say these these uh, these uh, these restaurants are bringing dogs in from Taiwan. You guys are going to treat trainers. You don't care about your dogs. Even though you know the treat don't work, even though we've had conversations with your dog, you're personally taking it out on me for whatever reason. I still don't know why, but you're going to the treat trainer and you're treat training the dogs who have the dysfunctions and the dog themselves never psychologically mature. They don't learn how to process their events. And it's like, wow, this personal satisfaction of whatever you want to do is subjecting these dogs to these behaviors. Uh, I have Minky here from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Over 20,000 dogs they've rescued from the meat dog trade. Okay, horrific situations from extreme abuse of cases in the United States and Mexico. They've, they've rescued all these horrific issues and these dogs severely traumatized. Over 20,000 dogs. They have a, a well-known uh, behaviorist, animal trainer behaviorist on their board of directors. They have a, a cast of people within Los Angeles because they're connected to Hollywood that they could call on for training, right? Cesar Milan was there with them. Um, they, they passed HR 6720 that got passed by the U.S. Senate in, in, in you know, for uh, criminalizing dog and cat meat. All these people that they could have gone to, all these people who would do it for free just to be able to say, hey, I did it for Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, they sent Minky to me. Over 20,000 dogs. We have an agreement that I, I need to have them uh, complete, but <laughs> over 20,000 dogs sent them to me. And they knew I didn't use treats. And that's what they liked about it because they said that made sense. So we got these organizations here bringing Taiwan dogs, bringing dogs from um, uh, Iran as well, and they're taking them to treat trainers. Maybe because the treat trainers are doing it for free. I, I guess that's it. But really, it's the health and the mental health of your dog or your dogs that you're rescuing going to a treat trainer worth it because you're getting it for free or for some lower price that you're not even making money off of me or but or, or off of them but you're subjecting your dog that you're bringing in saying that you want to love and help them but you're sending them to a treat trainer who's going to go yeah give the dog a treat give the dog oh the dog's still skittish well the dog's just that way that's what people say the dog is just that way it's disgusting like you just I, I, I said earlier at the top of here, aside from the dog uh, meat trade, right? And the, like I said, it just makes me really incensed about that subhuman peasant type uh, thing. But these skittish dogs are coming here. 
and they're brutal. You look at the Cody video, uh, Alex Cody from Nami Kim, they asked me. The thing is, these dogs are suffering psychologically, and then you have some imbecile giving them treats to make them feel better. And it's never going to happen. Human beings, it's never going to happen. Like I said, you're having an argument, someone gives you a, a treat, you're going to be like, we're done. Body language experts, when they study the human being, when they're watching the human being, they're not saying, oh, let's give them some treats, let's give them some money, let's give them all the stuff. What the body language expert says, let's see them in their natural environment. That's all I want to see is what they're acting normally. That's how we can tell what they're thinking and doing and, and the nuances and the blinking and, and the, the way they pause and the quiver in the face. Like you watch that stuff, right? So treat training a dysfunctional dog, especially a skittish dog. These rescues are doing it deliberately. They don't care about your dog because for some whatever moralistic or eth uh, lack of ethics, they're doing this. Don't go to those rescues. Contact them and say, hey, who do you use for a trainer? And then you go, oh, okay, who's the trainer? And then you contact the trainer and say, so how do you work with these skittish dogs? And they say, well, we, you know, we give them treats and all that stuff because it's that dumb Pavlov, the dumb operant conditioning, the dumb PF, BF Skinner, the dumb Lima and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, we give treats to the dog. Yeah, we give treats to the dog. Oh, we try positive reinforcement. Oh, passive aggressive. All this aspect. Treats don't exist in the canine world. No food. Pavlov did that. 1897. 122 years ago when people owned slaves. That's what the entire training industry is predicated on that. Ivan Pavlov, Russian. Right? He wasn't even a, a, a behaviorist. So... Then it's B.F. Skinner with operant conditioning, four quadrants, totally debunked. Then Lima, which is done by the APDT and all that stuff, they're doing the same thing now. Oh, and they're just fumbling. But then at the same time, the scientists, animal scientists are saying, dogs are like two to three-year-old children, emotionally and mentally, cognitively speaking. They're like that. But then why would we give our little two-year-old child, three-year-old child in the toy store the toy when he's screaming and yelling? Were we going to give him candy all the time if he's bad? What do we create? We create a kid that's selfish, that doesn't understand how to process their environment. And then we have rescue organizations bringing in dogs from Iran and bringing in dogs from Taiwan, uh, giving treats, sending them treat trainers. That tells you what kind of quality of uh, individual is running these rescue organizations. It's just, it's just because it retards the dog's ability to emotionally and cognitively mature. This is a Friday night rant, I mean, for sure. But it, it, it's, it's retarding the dog ability to be self-sufficient and mature and recognize as a reasoning, sentient being. I've had dogs that have been beaten so badly they're blinded in the head, right? Been beaten in the head so badly they're partially blinded. They've got brain damage. I've got dogs who have scars on their heads from being beaten so badly. And they're trying to kill me inside my own. Home, and they don't chase me as I keep saying all the time they just follow me because they know I can't escape I could I could just walk out the door but they know that tree training is disgusting when it comes to a dysfunctional dog tree training is excellent if you're, you're trick training you got lower dysfunction aspects of a dog your obedience training treats are excellent it, it expedites compliance but when you're dealing with a dog that has psychological issues my gosh Wake the heck up. Your selfishness as a rescue org is destroying these dogs' lives. Just, 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 it's, 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 it's incendiary. I mean, just, it's immoral. So again, contact the rescue organizations. Contact the ones that bring in the dogs from Taiwan to Iran here and say, hey, who's your trainer? And then ask the trainer. Again, treat training... Then you know that's rescue org is just going right down the toilet. They don't care anymore. They're just out there to prove a point. And it's not even about it. I mean, I'm busy. So it, it's not that part about it. It's just the health of your dog. The health of your skittish dog or reactive, dangerous dog is being belittled by the rescue org itself. Because what do you do when you have a problem with your dog that you just adopted month, two months ago? You contact your rescue. What do I do? And then the rescue or founder says, go to this trainer. That's the disgust that goes on. They're 
consciously making a decision to prove the point. And it's not a financial aspect of it because I give reduced rates anyways. It's not that. And it's the fact that they're purposely subjugating your newly adopted, psychologically traumatized dog to somebody, to, to a method that is destructive. You'd never want anyone to keep giving you food and treats and buy you goods and gold unless you're a vacuous individual. But you never want that. And like I said, I've gone out with people who are quite successful. And, you know, it's great. And they're like, oh, you know, and they treat me like arm candy. And it's like, no, it's, I have a brain. I have a brain. And then it's, it's so funny because they're women who are quite attractive. And they get tr and they would tell me they didn't like being treated like that because they're like, you know, one of them I went out with had two, like, two major degrees. <laughs> and, and I'm like, if you didn't like it, then why are you doing it to me? And then that's what we're doing to our dogs. Like, then the dog stays skittish for the rest of their life. And the dog plateaus. The dog never heals. The foundation remains rotten as they put on a new floor of food on top of it. Every single dog I've worked with, from the most predatory to the most extremely skittish dogs. No food, no treats, nothing. I give them snacks when I'm not trying to train them or when I'm not dealing with their psychological issues. I give them snacks. Not at any time have I been approached so close where a dog is about to bite me. And like I said, I've been ragdolled by a Great Dane, 180 plus pound Great Dane, grabbed me and ragdolled me when he and his handler is, didn't hold on to him properly in their hotel room. When a dog is this close, you know, I don't, afterwards, I don't give him a treat. And it, I'm talking like almost like 40 seconds where he's just standing there and he's not moving. I've had other ones come after me, chase me. Different reactions, different dysfunctions, but not at any time do I go, here you go, have a treat. Not any time would I have the treat in there. And when a dog is like that skittish, right? Anybody who has a skittish dog or reactive dog, sir, you probably knows this. You can't give them a treat. They're not going to take it. They don't care because all they want to do is proceed on their primal behavior. And that's what treat training is missing. And these freaking organizations that do that, they don't care about the dogs. They only care about the numbers and the money and that's it. That's all I'm saying. It's disgusting. All right. So uh, there's that. I mean, I talk about poor understanding of skittish dog behavior and stuff like that. It just, my gosh, these are like our children. These are like children. They, they, they hold so much in our hearts. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get to the question here from Sarah. Okay, Sarah, are you still there? Okay, under, you understand? Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, Sarah poses a question in my reactive dog group. Like I say, is go to rfrfbarkbark.com, go to free help for your dogs. Then you go to, uh, you, there's a link, you see that, and then you join my group, then you post it, follow, watch, read other people's posts so you have an idea. There's a description on the right sidebar on how to post it in, in clear, concise format with photographs of your dog. Not pictures, but photographs. Doesn't matter what kind of photographs you put up, whatever ones you want to, just put it up on there and go on there. I'm just going to move my, my uh, screen here so I can actually see it, what, what I'm doing now. Okay, so Sarah writes, and it's about 12, 12, 15 paragraphs, right? So it's quite a bit. It's probably, right? And, and here's the thing is, that's the type of detail I'd like. It takes me a while, but it's the type of detail. Because then, then I have a better idea of what you're talking about, Sarah. Because it's not like the one or two lines where you go, yeah, my dog is biting other people and I don't know what to do and I try giving him treats and I sometimes get him to sit and then that's it. It's like, okay, so when is he reactive? What time of day is he reactive? Is it before or after his meal? Uh, is it who is he with? Where is it that it happens? Is it inside, outside? What are you using for a leash? What are you using for a collar? All these kinds of things I'm asking about. Where's your dog's history? Uh, what's your dog's history? Who has he been with? What was the rescue that he came from, right? Because I look up the rescue as well. All these things, I'll, I'll do that if I have curiosity or if the story's not straight. That, that's what a good trainer or behaviorist will do. And they'll ask you for your dog's name. And you know what Sarah did? The fourth word in, hi, this is Prince. That shows you, Sarah, that shows me that you love him a lot. And, and not like I said, I read through it quickly, and, and so I'll read it now. But it shows that you love him a lot. And by the sounds of what I, I read was that you've gone through some challenges with him. But the first line, the fourth word, hi, this is Prince. She doesn't, Sarah doesn't even care about, hey, you know what, thanks a lot for helping me and all that. She only cares about her baby. 
80. And that's what I'm talking about again, you know, the, these people, these organizations, these, uh, these owners who aren't paying attention to their own reactive dog that happened to Deborah tonight with Leo. These, it's your dog, you're responsible, vicarious liability. Another dog, I'm just going to go on a tangent again, another dog that was with a dog walker here in town that's been doing for uh, 1998, so um, what is that, so, uh, 21 years was with the, a dog uh, that I worked with the, this client uh, before, and so he was able to get his dog to a trainer, I'm sorry, to a dog walker, and the dog walker wasn't paying attention after about three weeks and then got into a fight. Their dog, his dog, with the, at the trainer, uh, sorry, at the walker, got into a fight with another dog, and then it was a thousand dollar vet bill. And what did this dog walker say? It's not my fault. Literally said, I saw that, I saw the message, and I was like, well, it's vicarious liability. If you're driving your car, you lend your car to somebody and they crash it, vicarious liability. You're walking somebody else's dog. You're responsible for them. Especially they tell you, I have a reactive dog or I don't have a reactive dog or I have a happy dog or I have a sad dog. You know you're responsible for it. So with Sarah's aspect of it, it's beautiful because you say that. Okay, so I'm gonna go off on it. Uh, Sarah's description is in her, uh, uh, her 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 details is in my description thing. Like I say, the photos of Prince is in my closed group. So it says, uh, she says, Sarah says, uh, one year and eleven months old. So there, she wants me to. You want me to know who your dog is already? You're painting this beautiful picture about who you see in your dog already. You're telling me not only his name. You're telling me how old he is. You're giving me details. You're describing. You're creating a, a, a beautiful painting. And it's abstract without the photos. But you're creating this thing where I get to really understand what's going on. Now, you see, now I'm like, I'm, I'm, before I was just upset with these, uh, these idiotic rescues and, 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 and owners. But here I'm like, this is love. Right off the bat, Sarah. I don't know what your husband's name is, but he is one lucky guy. And you can you can punch him in the head now. <laughs> like you, you're under undervaluing. Him. He owes you flowers. Like like the details you've gotten here is just gorgeous. So uh, okay, uh, hi, this is Prince, one year and eleven months old, born in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, got him at six weeks old. Definitely had separation anxiety. He would dream a lot about running, feet kicking. And I actually have an article that I talk about. Exactly, Jennifer. I have an article that I'm, I'm a month and a half behind uh, talking about does your dog dream about you? And what is the cognitive type of dreaming? Is it a logical dream or is it an emotional dream? That's what I'm talking about. We have those type of dreams. We have the dreams where it's structured. We have the dreams where it's emotional and it's all over the place. So does your dog. Um, oh, yeah, the pit bull. Uh, Toronto. Uh, uh, yeah, the breed, the BSL, the breed sp uh, specific legislation. That's, they might as well just say, "Hey, we don't we don't want any Chinese people here." It's just disgusting the 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 the, the narrow mindedness of of just society sometimes like that for for the other people, not us for us dog lovers and all that stuff. Okay, uh, sorry, I just gotta be focused here. Um, okay, uh, so he would dream a lot about running, uh, feet kicking, and all that stuff. Um, he had a lot of sensitivity to chicken, so we had to change his food a bunch of times, fed him raw, and he would growl and try to bite us if we came close to his food. You know what I'm going to do? Because you already have the description, and the description is not just only in my group, but it's also in my description uh, of this uh, live vlog. So I'm just going to stop instead of going it all over, because then it's like, why? Okay, so you fed him raw, he'd growl and try to bite us if we came too close to his food. Um, okay, so he was born in Trinidad, you got him to six weeks old. So typically, and you're right, Definitely had separation anxiety. It's a developmental aspect of it, right? Um, he wasn't, anyway. Okay, so uh, six weeks is obviously quite young. Uh, typically, preference is between eight to 10 weeks. 10 weeks is the best, but then again, it creates the bonding aspect. And obviously, a lot of times, breeders just want to get rid of the dog as soon as possible because two extra weeks is still a lot more work because, you know, they get bigger and bigger and blah, blah, blah. And they seem to be somewhat independent, but they still aren't. Okay, so. Um, so he'd growl when he tried to bite us when he got close. 
uh, to right, the, the guarding aspect of it. So that all depends on how he is with play with you, if he's been playing with toys as well, if he's been kind of reactive to you uh, with toys or if he's guarding his toys or he, when you go to grab his toy, he runs away. And what type of running away does he do? Because then he's going to give me a determination on the value of what he puts on his play and his own ability to feel self-sufficient. He got mange really bad around three months old for about two thirds of a month and um, uh, we basically stopped all basic training during this time as it was hard to even let him out of, uh, out of the air since his immune system was so weak and he was very irritated. So he's already agitated and he has, so then unfortunately, you know, by the chain of events, right, so, he, so the socialization is somewhat limited on his end, which is not anyone's fault, right, mange, it can be, it's contagious, right, so, um, you know, okay. Uh, we then found out through blood tests he also had tick fever but caught it luckily in time and tick fever is, is potentially fatal obviously it can cause seizures and so forth like that and tremors and everything like that so now we're thinking right now there might be some neurological aspects of it depending on the level of it depending on what your vet said. Uh, he would sometimes get out of hand and try to bite so we had to pin him down and usually my husband would send him to his kennel and he would growl and show his teeth once he gets in okay so that might come back to the part of his age of only being six weeks of age and not being able to learn how to play properly with other dogs right oh, about two to three months of age or or what oh he got mange at three months of age and then he had uh, then he had it for another two to three months is that what you mean okay well we'll, we'll get back to that um when it comes to that part of uh, uh, pinning him down and all that stuff, um, he'd try to bite, so we had to pin him down, and usually my husband would send him to his kennel, and he would growl, show his teeth once he gets into it. The stretch to progress, and he, we just couldn't understand what was going on and why he was acting this way towards us at times. So there's a lack of socialization. He didn't learn that as well with the other puppies, right? That's six weeks, so he didn't learn how to, you know, the bite aspects of it, like bite inhibition, whatever. He didn't learn how to play fairly, socialize as well. Um mange okay um and so that happened and then um when it came to the part oh sorry i can't see what that says it's not showing up there okay um okay um so uh he would sometimes try to get our hand and then then he would be pinned down okay so one of the things i talked about before in, in some of my uh episodes is regards to alpha right that's what it is alpha so the pinning down is really not something that you want to do anymore i don't know if you're still doing it but you don't want to do it at all Right. I mean, you can be firm, physically, firm, but putting him to the ground is a is a um, is a brute force aspect of it. And what that brute force does is it creates intimidation, brute force. And how do I uh, give you a human analogy on that? Well, say your husband wasn't as nice and lucky as he was, uh, and your husband and you got into a fight, and he just grabbed you, threw you to the ground. How would you feel? And you have the sophisticated brain to understand what happened or whatever happened and justify it or not justify it. Your dog doesn't know what's going on. And they talk about the submission all that stuff. It's just brute force. It's just basically saying, I'm going to control you. Dog doesn't learn. He only learns intimidation. He only learns to be intimidated. And what ends up happening is, if he's got a strong personality, he goes, I'm going to start fighting back. Because, again, you've got people that will either, if they're confronted with something, they're either going to get into a fight or they're going to run away. And you have sometimes those people who are somewhat oppressed or suppressed, and they eventually one day go, you know what, I'm done. And then they, quote unquote, lash out and become unpredictable themselves because it's out of character. Dog's processing a tenth of a second. So what ends up happening is the alpha aspect of it is an intimidation side of things. The dog doesn't whole process it other than the fact that it's a computational aspect. And a smarter dog or a more emotionally uh, dysfunctional dog is going to view that in a different way. Um, so we'll get to the rest of that here. Let me just clear that off here. Okay. Uh, this started progress and we just couldn't understand what was going on and why he was acting this way towards us. Um, okay, so he's going to bite. And why was he biting out of, out of hand sometimes? Times. So was he biting because you guys were nipping? I mean, he was nipping you. Was he biting um, during play? Was he biting when he wanted something? Was he biting with a toy? You know, we're talking about the, the food, the, the chicken and all that stuff, the toys and all that stuff. You see what I mean? So now we're painting the picture of what's going on abstract-wise. Why is that happening? Is it because um, he was just in a bad mood or he was tired? Right? Dogs get tired too. Same thing like us. We get tired. So you can imagine the crankiness on that and they don't 
emotionally have control and they just lose it sometimes. So um, why is that? And the question is, too, if your husband's doing the alphaing on him by pinning him down, right, are you doing it as well? So is he seeing this disparity that's going on or is he seeing a weakness between the two of you? Is he seeing a, a, a familial structure within the family of position where he is? Like I said yesterday, uh, I'm uh, eight out of uh, out of eight. I'm in a family of eight. I'm number six out of eight. I know where I am in my thing, no matter what. And like I said, I have an, a brother who's a younger brother. He's eight years old. Uh, he's number eight, and he's younger than me. Uh, he's in Toronto, and he's he's quite a successful lawyer. Regardless, and he's you know he's right. Regardless, I still know I'm his older brother, and I can still talk to him like I'm his older brother to a point. But I can still talk to him like. I don't know where I am in my family, in my family position. So I talk about seniority in other vlogs as well. So, um, okay, so what is your protecting his food, playing and protecting food, dropped on the floor and all that stuff, bedtime and all that. Okay, the bedtime aspect of it, uh, is he coming into your bedroom? Is he sleeping in your bedroom? Is he sleeping in a crate? Right, so you can answer that, and then we'll get back to protecting his food, playing and protecting food dropped on the floor and all that stuff. So then um, the question is, you know, was he on kibble to begin with? And then he got transitioned into raw, or is he on raw? That kind of stuff. Is he on cooked food? Um, you know, what happens to protecting the food play and protecting the food dropped on the floor? Okay. <laughs> so then he's, he's got the emotional context uh, as well with him. He's got a bit of a high codependency on it, judging him by the way you're writing on that part here now. Um, just the way you structured it here. Okay. So um, create a competition created competition for the food by pinning him down by doing things like that because he's there he's enjoying it um yesterday i have a uh, uh, minky who's growling and he's resource guards food right and i i feed all my dogs raw i do two to three hundred pounds a month in raw uh minky had a beef bone uh two other the, my danes were there there every single one's resource guarding even little sam's legs and so what ends up happening they're right here and i showed everybody from the camera around and they're literally inches away from Minky, who's chewing on this raw beef bone because he, his is still left, and the other two are there. And I just went, and I just, and I didn't get angry. I just stop it. And, I, and before, but in the beginning, when I started to down train them all from not fighting with each other or attacking me when I came by their dish, and that would happen too, you know, and it's really bad because um, they would really grab, yeah, anyways, so, and I would always have to wear, like, a long sleeve shirt or, or jacket, just, you know, to hide the bruises, right, so, so no one thought I was getting beat up by, by, or anyways, whatever, um, so I would talk him down, but I never got to the point where I would make them feel that they were threatened by the food being taken away from them, right, okay, so let's see, open the crate and all that stuff here, what happens if he sleeps on your bed? Or sleeps on the on the, on a mat or a bed on the floor or something like that. Would he be the same way? I think what's happening here is he's been taught so far. I haven't gone past this uh, uh, fourth or fifth paragraph. I think he has been taught that it's okay to be territorial, possessive of his room, of his bedroom, the crate of his bedroom. So to him, to Prince, this is my bedroom. I don't want you in my bedroom. Okay, my nose of question starts from so uh, Sarah writes. We started kibble, then raw immune system was weak, right from the tick and uh, uh, mange. We know aggression started probably uh, probably from protecting food, and then now back to kibble, taste of the wild, uh, submission, all stuff. Um, okay. Um, no, he loves the bed and the couch. Does he? Does he go into the crate for a bedtime? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait for that aspect of it. But when it comes down here to um. Okay, so, you know, start a kibble is going to be a high-value target, right? Like, the cause of resources and all stuff, right? So, it's going to be something that he wants because it's evolutionary indigenous to him, right? It's inherent. It's evolution. Wild dogs, canines, wolves, they all ate meat. They all hunted, right? They're not, they're, they're carnivans. They're not eating vegetables and stuff like that on a regular basis unless they need fiber to, to kind of calm their stomach down or something like that. Like, when a dog eats grass, for chlorophyll and all these other aspects of it. Um, okay, so oh, okay, he goes in his crate at night. What would happen if you left him out of his crate at night? That's a question. I was just trying to see if I can do the Skype thing or, or something like that, and where I can do video and screen share it, and then actually I'm gonna look at that. Maybe I can do a Skype 
screen share on on Facebook, and then we can actually have real live uh, um, uh, training and communication. So let me try to figure that out. Uh, like I said, people always say they're going to help me do it. No one ever does, right? So it's like, okay, whatever. Um, and I'm not technologically savvy. Okay, so uh, I was just going to get back to this thing about here about growling and the teeth and all stuff. Uh, and so, um, uh, okay, let's start the progress where we just couldn't understand what was going on and why he was acting this way towards us at times. We then used to take him out and meet other dogs. He was very timid and scared. Even smaller dogs would scare him. We kept socializing him, and sooner than later, he stayed with another dog for two weeks while we were away on vacation and had the time of his life, we were told, right? And so was he at a daycare or was he with family or friends? Okay, so let me know that. Um, when it comes to him being, uh, he will sleep on the couch at night. Oh, cute. Oh gosh, come on. Yes, I would love that. Uh, oh, you mean sleeping on the bed? Okay. Um, actually, I'm kind of we're kind of losing it now, right? Sorry, the timing and and I'm moving on a bit. Um, okay. So um, uh, okay. we then used to take him out to uh, and meet other dogs. He was very timid and scared. Even smaller dogs would scare him. So what does he do when he is timid and scared? So does he get a little bit like, does he hide behind you? Does he become lungy? Does he start pulling away? One, Which direction does he pull away as well? Does he pull uh, to the left, to the right, like if the dog's coming towards you? Which direction is he pulling? Uh, which direction is the dog coming from? Is he on your left or your right? Uh, we want to know that because he's pulling to one way. If he's trying to pull away from the dog or he's trying to go back home, uh, is he pulling forward? Is he excited and wanting to meet the other dog? Or is he excited and growling? So we want to kind of determine that part as well, right? You see all these little tendrils that all, all meet to it, okay? Um, I would love to have people. Yeah, same here. This is because this is like, I'm like, and, I, and I'm so wildly organic and I'm all over the place. And by the time I get back to what, what you remind me of, I'm like, wait a minute, shiny. Okay, so look, it's a balloon. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, maybe we'll, I'll, I'll try to figure out if I can do that on the screen sharing side of things, right? Because I want to make it public. Right, like I did yesterday with Hoagie and um, uh, his 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 dad Matt in regards to looking at the video. Oh, okay. So is he off leash then when he's drooling and running towards me? So that's an anxiety driven aspect of it. So this shows an insecurity and immaturity that he has right there. Okay. In context of everything that you've written down so far and what I uh, what you've written down here and as we move down, but so far is that anxiety that that context and it's an inability to emotionally uh, process what's going on. Um, okay. We traveled without him twice for two weeks in 2018 and once for four months um, from January uh, to April 2019. It was out of choice at the time when we had to leave for four months. He stayed with a family member who also had another male pit bull who tried to attack him, but nothing happened. Um, did you see any scars on him? Did you see any uh, behavioral differences when you came back? Was he still happy with the other pit bull? Uh, the other dog, I mean? Sorry. I, I'm not going to... You know, I should tell, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you know, how I feel about the idiots that do BSL. Uh, this is, gives them more fire, those e idiots more fuel, right? Those, those people who are discriminatory. Um, you know, I grew up with racism, so I just, stuff like this is just another extension of ignorance and stupidity. Okay, so um, uh, how was he with the other family when he came back after four months? I mean, was he happy to see you? Did he remember you? How was his interaction with the other dog? Did he want to leave right away with you? Did he follow you around everywhere in the house when you went back into the home to get him? And when you came home with uh, with Prince, did he follow you everywhere? Did he sit somewhere? Did he stay in certain places? Did he play with a lot of toys? Did he not? Did he have the same growly effect when he went into the kennel when he, he was with the other family? Did he stay in a kennel? Was he free range? All that stuff, right? So um, we can continue this in an, another conversation because there's going to be a lot of information here. But all these questions that I'm asking, right? All these questions that are being asked gives me a better and clearer idea. Okay. Uh, Prince was then separated, but nothing happened. That's what it was told. Prince was then separated from the household he was at and stayed at another house. Okay, so he was there for four months. And so then he was there with uh, the other family and then he got moved to another family with no pets. So that tells me if that's if it's in the same form period with the same family, then he went to another family. That means that Prince did get in, or that there was excuse me that there was at least one, if not two, interactions, negative interactions between the two dogs. Because why would you just move the dog over unless you're like, oh, I can't keep the dog anymore, and or maybe the people didn't know you were going to be gone for four months, and they were like, this is too long or too much. But if they already have a dog, then 
means that there's a, another issue. Unless Prince or their dog or both dogs were barking too much or digging holes or causing issues, ripping up the, the drywall, why did they move him to another dog, uh, dog's home for the rest of the time period? He was apparently chained up the... Oh, wow, jeez. He was apparently chained up the entire time because, uh, yeah, obviously I didn't read this properly the first... Oh, I, I just skimmed it, right? Because I, I want to get the hit while I'm doing it live with you. <laughs> That's disgusting. He was apparently chained up for the entire time because no one knew how to walk and because of the pulling on leash. So then is that the other family that... Yeah, the fa first family that was a babysit a dog sitting him, did that family decide, like, uh, I can't walk him anymore, he's too much? And... Um, Oh, he had a scar on his back leg. Okay, so they got into the fight. They lied to you that he didn't get into a problem. It was an altercation, as I'm going to guess on that. Maybe he got hurt outside, but you know what? Why would they move the Prince from their home with a dog, already with the same breed, to another home? And then that other home had no dog, obviously had no idea how to take care of a, of a have empathy, compassion, ended up chaining him out. And did they chain him outside or did they chain him inside? He was apparently chained up for the entire time because no one knew how to walk him because of pulling on the leash. Which is, a, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. The, the, uh, that's like an excuse. Because a lot of times people do that. They would just get a different collar they'll get a choke or even a prong collar and if there's the issue of him pulling on the leash they would have probably contacted you or contacted the other family and they they, they chained him up outside too holy crap do you see like my rant this morning, my go, uh, the, earlier here, going off the rails about the, these idiotic rescues that bring dogs from Taiwan and Iran and are sending the treat trainers and the, and the dog meat thing. Like, this is... Oh, my gosh. Freaking idiots. So they chained them up outside. Uh, so they chained them up outside for the whole time? So did they not even have a freaking yard for him? Like, they're a fenced yard or something? So they chained them up outside? I don't know my... Yeah, I hear you. I feel for you. Trust me, I feel for you. I'm already, you can tell I'm already pissed off and I don't even know him. I've seen his, uh, his puppy picture and this, you know, I've seen the other one as he's growing up and he's got the floppy ear. Wow. Like, I don't even see the picture. I just remember it. I, I don't have the picture here because it's, you know, obviously down the screen. So I don't, uh, freaking, I hope you're not friends with these people. Um, Okay. Uh, he, okay, uh, he was fed his meals and bathed normally, which is a lie. I doubt it. They probably, they probably bathed him before you came back. So it looked normal. Because if he's outside on a chain, <laughs> what did they say here? They didn't want him running in the house. He wanted, to, he wanted to go inside and be safe. Okay, I'm going to get to this and it's going to break your freaking heart actually. But we'll get to this in a little bit. Like, I don't normally swear. I'm not going to swear. Um, there's not a strong enough abuse laws out here because the politicians are weak boned in this case. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, he was fed his meals and bathed normally. He had interactions with kids sometimes. He loved kids and ladies. We were told he was very timid and scared towards the adults who were taking care of him. The only time he was happy when he was when he was kids was okay. So the reason why he was happy with the kids because they weren't threatening, they weren't dominating him, they weren't throwing him outside, right? He was timid and scared to the adults because he no longer understood that he had any value. There was no respect anymore. He was kicked out. Like a kid, a teenage kid, gets kicked out of their home and has to live on the streets. So that's what ended up happening. So that his timidness and him being scared, instead of me just waiting to the end, where I was going to say, it, it creates significant abandonment issues. Significant abandonment issues. 
And if he only can remember how much love he had before him, whether or not you guys were having to deal with the pinning and the alpha and the growling and all that stuff, that was the best home he ever had. And then it went from here, like the kid in the foster home, to the front, you know, like Cinderella kind of thing, to the crappy home, to the really crappy home. And then he became devalued as an individual. I talk about the dependency, the 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 the, the codependency, and all these kinds of things. So he became destroyed emotionally, mentally. So already having to deal with the growling. And the first guarding and all that kind of stuff, and then just basically being thrown to the outside on a chain outside, being afraid of the adults. He was afraid of it, which also it gives me. A, 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 I'm I'm having a guess that they were actually probably not very nice to him physically either, in regards to walking him on the thing, and then they just went effort, and they abdicated any type of human responsibility and went just you you're, you're a bad dog. I'm gonna throw you outside, stick you outside, and let you just be garbage. The kids will go out and play with them. So he's like, oh, great. My only human contact and it's love. Okay, it's the next one. Yeah, I just... Okay, uh, when we returned to the end of April, right, 2019. So this is just recently then. Uh, we then found out we were moving back to Toronto and uh, and we had no doubt he was coming back with us. So we got him neutered this May 2019. All the shots up to date, blood work. Uh, he got a little inflammation issue. Um, where was the inflammation? Okay. Uh, he's now here living with me and my husband in Toronto at our new home, hoping to have a better life for all of us and definitely for Prince. We have tried Bark Busters. You know Bark Busters. We give you the lifetime guarantee. It's $500, but after the second day, we never return your call again. They're a franchise. They're the most successful franchise, dog training franchise in the world. I think they started off in Australia. Right? They get a manual, they hand bug, Bark Busters and all stuff. I, you know, I, I'm just, like, today I'm just in a bad a bad mood. You know what I mean? I'm just in a bad mood about this whole thing because the way people are treating everywhere is none of this should be happening. We have tried Bark Busters and now training with uh, Canine Obedience, which is in Toronto. I don't feel confident these trainers understand him not uh, are not addressing the behaviors for why it is happening or, or even giving us a good enough answer on why we should be doing in those situations. Okay, so just me reading this stuff, I, I'm quite confident just reading this, these these ten paragraphs already or whatever, I've given you more information about his, his behavior already than you got from these people where you spent probably two thousand dollars already. I already know. I told you. I, I already wrote down in the thing. I already know what his issues are when I went and quickly read it through. And I haven't seen this. Uh, what is it now? It's like over a week now. I apologize, but I already know what the issues are. I already knew that. Okay, so here's the situation. Here's the issues that are going on. He is now reacted to every dog animal he sees. Aggression towards me and my husband, but mostly my husband. Okay, we'll get to that. We're going to go all these points and I'll go back to it. He backs up and he meets men at first. He loves meeting women and kids. Uh, get super happy. Who doesn't? What guy doesn't like women and kids? Well, women. Eh. Um, he's scared about a lot of things outside or even inside. He will randomly curl his tail inward and tuck his ears backwards. He is scared of car rides, showers. He, We don't even know which color to walk him on. Every trainer has been saying different things. We also have a muzzle to use or not use. He's not aggressive about everything, only in certain situations with us. And that's what I'm confused about. But it does not feel like he's battling with feeling more in danger. Oh, sorry. But it, sorry, the computer's a bit far away. Um, uh, where, did, where did I go? Um, he's not aggressive about everything, only in certain situations with us. And that's what I'm confused about. But it does feel like he's battling with feeling more endangered than feeling safe and confident. We just want him to help and give him the life he deserves. It breaks my heart to see him like this, and I want the best life for him, whatever that may look like for him. First picture of him coming home when he got him. At the, oh, oh, the picture's below. Sorry, I thought the pictures were... Uh, okay, uh, sorry. I mean, he's absolutely adorable. And he doesn't... And he's not a... I mean, he might be mixed with Pitbull, uh, but he's definitely gorgeous, and, he, and he's great markings and I actually I had to look at his baby picture and his other uh, uh, his uh, adult picture because of the the markings on it right it's just it's just a really beautiful just really beautiful and let me just open up his uh, his eyes here on this thing okay so right off the bat he's waiting for the other shoe to drop that's it instability waiting for the other shoe to drop insecurity abandonment issues distrust of human beings etc 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 right so like I said it's straightforward so point number one he is now reacted to every dog and animal he sees. 
Why is that? Because of the lack of socialization, not just the mange and all that part, but because of the attack that most likely happened in the first home that uh, was dog sitting from when you guys were away. And then the second home where he had no socialization whatsoever. And he was probably barking at people and, I mean, dogs, things going by his uh, by the fence and all that stuff. Or where, if there was a fence there. So, <laughs> lack of socialization. These are just little points and then we're going to bring it all together again. Uh, aggression towards me and my husband, but mostly my husband. He backs up when he meets men at first. So, the first half of that, aggression towards me and my husband. Uh, aggression towards me and my husband, uh, but mostly my husband. Because of the alpha aspect of it. It's just, you know, when two men confront each other in the bar, right? You know, like, I'm going to, right? Like that, it, to a point, I'm just saying that as a, as a gross, rough analogy. But on his end, he's realized that he does this type of behavior with other people, which means is why he's timid to the human beings, which is why I think there was some sort of physical aspect of this. So he's going to be like that to your husband because he's really remembers that latently. He remembers that if I'm reactive to men, I'm not going to get in trouble because you're going to back the heck off. So the alpha aspect of it, it was all developed forward there, and then the behavior he was being treated. So that means if he was in the fights or got bitten or whatever, and you know, if I have a dog and someone else is dog sitting and then or whatever, uh, I've seen this all the time. They always blame the, the other dog. They don't blame their own dog. They go, you know, or else they go, well, you know what, there's a fight and my dog started, but your dog can't come here anymore, like daycare, right? Your dog can't come here anymore, even though the other dog started, because, right? Because they want the paying customer that's been there longer. When it comes to the, the whoever took care of them, if there was that reaction, then they went, you know, F it. They went, they went, F it. what's this here? Oh, hi, Gina. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Amy, but I, I've got questions already beforehand. I'm sorry, Amy. Um, um, okay, so um, the the, uh, the aggression from your husband and other men, uh, he backs up when he meets men at first. So, okay, the part with your husband is the familiarity, which means that he feels comfortable enough to go, I'm going to attack you or, or be offensive to you because you're not going to come at me because you're afraid of me or that I'm used to it and I know how to get you because I know your weak points of... of attack you and then when he backs up men when he meets at first so he's somewhat afraid which means that, again there might have been either if it's not physical then it was verbal abuse that he received and so if he is backing off with men and then he comes a little bit closer to them afterwards then you're like okay then um is he friendly with those men that do pet him and all that stuff does he allow them to be pet does he somewhat uh nip does he whatever right so we need to know that part like i say go over this and we can kind of put a second post to it or do it add it to the comment section here you can answer everything this is going to be up on youtube in a little bit and you can do that it's going to be better on that way um and and like i say thank you so much for subscribing to everything and following me on social media and all that stuff and those of you who haven't please do so just to help spread this word um okay <laughs> he loves meeting women and kids and he gets super happy so that goes to the point then of the kids that he was living with in the second place that was taking care of him when he was chained up outside and so he has no threat on that and with women obviously you're a very endearing loving mom to to prince so that's going to be the issue there um which again goes back to the point men okay uh you know the problem with men thankfully you know like i say i only go out with women uh, the problem with men is that um such arrogance and brute force behavior if it doesn't fix, we break it, right? The wards and everything like that. So it's a brute force aspect of it. So he's just, unfortunately, there. He's scared about a lot of things outside or even inside, right? Well, you know what? Uh, he will randomly curl his toe inside. Well, he's not randomly doing, right? Well, I talked earlier, actually, about reactionary and, co and, and consequential, right? <laughs> so his behavior, by the sounds of it, is actually, uh, uh, um, if he does it every, okay, I'm going to say it's consequential. We're going to get into more details as we flow through this on that part. But he's scared about a lot of things outside or even inside the home, right? So he's not used to being inside the home on a consistent basis because he's only remembering what his behavior has been like outside, which is to be scared and frightened. You're taking someone, again, from inside of a house and you're throwing them outside to throw the kid outside, a runaway. He's afraid of everything. And then when he's a puppy, right, he's young, immature, doesn't know how to process this. 
It's like being a stray dog. Like talk about those Formosa mountain dogs. It's a stray dog feeling who's going to kill me next. I'm out on a chain. I got no safety at all. And I'm on a chain, which is not just like a leash where I can bite through it. I'm on a chain. I can't get away at all. It's like being trapped. Anyways, just, okay. Uh, he's scared of car rides and showers. <laughs> okay. So car rides. Uh, I'm not sure about that part. Uh, what is his behavior? Does he tremor? Does he get scared? What What is it, right? You know, a little bit more detail on that. I love the details you're giving me, Sarah, genuinely do, because look how much depth we're getting here. Um, the showers. Goes back to what I was saying before. That he probably just received maybe one bath, maybe two baths before you showed up. And there's a very good chance that it was cold water, garden hose. If somebody's already chaining up a dog outside, the last thing they're going to do is use warm water. If somebody's abusive to the dog, any dog outside on a chain, they're not going to bring the dog inside to wash them. They're not going to bring Prince inside to wash them. All they're going to do, if they do bring Prince in to get a bath before you show up so he smells good, so it gets rid of of all the smell of the dirt and living outside. So these people, whoever they are, are not nice people. So it would have been cold water or else they would have sprayed them down with water. They would have punished them. It's not a spray bottle aspect of it. Maybe they have tried it, but that's where we're at. Uh, scared of car rides. <laughs> Was he good with car rides beforehand or not, right? So there we go. Uh, we don't even know which color to walk him on. Every trainer has been saying different things. We have a muzzle from... Um, so, so the muzzle part I'm wondering about what you're talking about is, uh, it was cold water. See? Yep. It was cold water. Right. So we put all this together. Like I said, uh, I'm giving you more than you're going to get from any in-person trainer or behaviorist. Uh, you, you read my screenshots in my help your dog for free, uh, tab on my rescue page on my RFR Bark Bark, uh, website. I'm reading dogs and personalities and everything at 100% accuracy. And that's why it hurts me so much when I read stuff like this and I see these idiotic uh, Formosa Mountain Dog uh, rescues that take dogs to treat trainers, like all this stuff. I'm connecting to Prince. You can see the in, in, entire ego of Prince has been destroyed, almost destroyed. There's probably about 17% left in him. That you have to rebuild, and yes, you can rebuild his self esteem, his self worth, and his self confidence. That's what I do. I help dogs rebuild that or build it for the first time. Okay, so uh, with the collar, what does he do? So you've used different collars. What does he do on which collar, right? Or how is his behavior on this collar? How is his behavior on this collar? Or is he always pulling? Is he, is he, what is he doing, right? Does he try to bite the leash? All these kinds of aspects that are anxiety driven and rooted in that psychogenetic aspects of his behavior, right? The psychosis of the dog. <laughs> Your dog, Prince. Um, okay, so I just, every single dog I've ever worked with, except for the, the ones that are at flight risk that can pull out, I just, and not for you, right? I've just used a regular fabric collar. So 120 pound, 180 pound, 220 pound Mastiff. I've always used just a regular collar. And that's it. Two inch fabric collar. Make sure that it doesn't pull out or the, or the ones that you uh, buckle in. Because when they pull, they can break it right off. And, and, and you're like, holy crap. So, um, or else if you have the little, don't get the ones that have the little plastic clip, like, unless they're a good brand and not the one that has a little, uh, there's a brand there that has like a little metal emblem on it and it's a piece of garbage and I've seen them break twice now when it's not good, right? I, people have told me that too. <laughs> so I just use a regular color on the dogs. Uh, I've never used a prong color. I've never used a shock color or anything that, cause it's a brute force aspect again, right? Shock colors, just like. Where does that come from? And if your dog already scared or reactive and you have someone hit you in the face and it's like, say you're blind and it's in, you're in a dark room and someone just hits you in the face. Shock collar, right? So there's that. Uh, prong collar creates a lot of pain. Anyone who says that prong collar doesn't hurt the dog is an imbecile and you should run away from them. 
and know that they don't have any empathy. I can tell the shot the, the, the prong collar hurts the neck. And I actually put one around because they're big enough for the, the Danes. I put it around, around my neck. And I just kind of went like that. And it freaking hurts. And people say, well, dogs don't have a pain. Blah, blah, blah. I talk about pain redundancy. Anyways, they feel it. If you can go up to Prince and just blow on him and he turns and he flinches, he felt it. If you can just touch him on the back end, and I've talked about Great Danes, blah, 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 that the dangerous ones that flipped on me when I do that. He feels that. Just the tiniest little touch. My voice, sorry. Tiniest little touch. He feels it. What do you think the prong collar is doing? These idiots that are doing it. Because these people who are using those devices, the professionals, are because they don't know what they're doing. Or they're not strong enough to handle their do the dogs that they're working with. Like it's, it's brutal. Every single one I'm using, like I have Anthony, he's 160 pounds and he's only 18, 19 months of age. And I have him, boom, 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 working on it. My trainer now says prong doesn't hurt and wants us to use the e collar. He doesn't know, yeah. You almost made me swear. You almost made me swear, Sarah. <laughs> nice one. Yeah, well, that trainer is an amateur. That trainer on my scale, my scale starts at V3. Which dogs are just starting to exhibit issues or subtly exhibiting issues. V4 is the same thing as bite level four when it comes to the APDD, Dr. Ian Dunbar's rhetorically immature scale. Uh, V5 is the same. V6, which they say as bite level six is when a dog kills somebody or kills another dog or another animal and can't be fixed. Fixed. Mine's V6 the same way. My mind goes up. So I deal with the V10 dogs that are 150 plus pounds that have attacked at least 12 people. And I'm not talking like just bite you and that, that, right? I'm talking about sends people to the hospital. Those are the dogs I work with. Those dogs, not even bragging, those dogs will kill trainers like that in a heartbeat. Try putting on a regular fabric collar. You know, you can put a slip collar on. It's easy to get it on and off the dog sometimes, right? A reactive dog. Try putting on a regular fabric collar where you have to put the clip in through the, the buckle. And then they turn on you and they've gotten me. And then I got to do it again. And I, I'm bleeding and I still got to Okay, that's kind of good. I'll do it again. I, I don't need to use brute force when the dog is psychologically already hurt. You're, say you have a friend of yours who's lashing out at everybody because you found out that his his mom died in a car accident and he's just lashing out at everybody. And you and you go punch him in the face and say, hey man, man up. It, it, I, there's a horrible analogy. I'm just emotionally, today is just, I don't know why. It's just, this, this, uh, you know, the meat dog trade just brings it back to this peasant mentality and low educated people. But the prong collar hurts like freaking crazy and the e-collar is shocking your dog and surprising the heck out of your dog and making him fearful psychologically not knowing what's going on and it creates a deliberate brute force compliance on your dog. It's the alpha in a different method and it's even worse because your dog knows not where it comes from. Prince has no idea where the shocking is coming from and he's probably, your train's probably, oh, turn it up to 10 or whatever it turns it up to. The prong collar, the same thing. It's an amateur's use. It's an insecure, unskilled, inexperienced, individual, professional that needs to use brute force devices. And yes, I have a, I have a rare gift with, with dogs, okay? God has given and shared this gift with me to share with people. And every single dog is no treats no whatever and so yeah i can say well you know i people can say well james you know you have this ability blah blah this gift and blah 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 okay but the reality is people even then don't need to it doesn't matter if you're not at my level you can still figure out how to work with a dog without using brute force devices you don't need to use brute force devices when a dog is already in pain and is, is already hurt Using a brute force device just makes it worse. So I gotta keep this time. Oh my gosh, I'm so pissed about hearing this idiot saying that.
That's why I said to him, why would we use that when we would be dealing with the root root issue? And he said it's used as a correction, so he doesn't do it. Because you know what that trainer sees? Is it a male or female trainer? He said, okay. That trainer thinks he's really good, and he's been referred to as a good trainer, and he has a lot of great positive things on, and he probably puts on videos that he goes and shows off how great he is, but he doesn't do a full video journey. He doesn't show the dog in a journey. All my videos, except for Minky, which, again, the first Minky video, but, okay, I'll just let me get to it. All my videos are single sessions. Axel, the German Shepherd, bit two family members in the face at separate occasions, attacked other people, uh, attack other dogs. Lifetime muzzle order, dangerous dog designation. You see a muzzle punching me in the face. 36 minutes took me. You're dealing with a caveman. That guy is a caveman. That's a guy who thinks he's too good for everybody. That's a guy who's been fed so many accolades and, oh my gosh, you're so incredible. Oh, what you did with my dog, you're amazing. Look at the stuff that I have on me. I have all, I have all these groups that I work with and they say incredibly positive, great things about me and I have the media attention. But I'm still not following the stupid game that these people play. I get ostracized for stuff. I get trolled for all these things. I don't follow the cliques. I could be charging more than $230 a session. People like that with the prong collar are morons. And they're insecure individuals. And they have no true compassion. They have no true compassion for Prince. They have arrogance. Like seriously, that contributes to his... Prince knows you drop him off with a trainer that's an imbecile that's going to treat him bad. So he's going to go like, well, why is mom doing this? I don't have any trust in mom and dad anymore. Abandonment issues, insecurity, low self-esteem. Codependency issues are brutal on his end. He doesn't know when the other shoe, like I said before, he doesn't know when the other shoe is going to drop. You can see it in his eyes, in his face, in his body position. Right, Jackie, you're, if you're still online, Jackie, right, I posted up what you said about, uh, yeah, I, I read your dog and I told you, uh, you said, even in your post, 100% of his behavior, I was accurate on, on your Great Dane on, on uh, I can't pronounce her name because I just, well, never pronounce it properly. I don't want to mur mur uh, butcher it. But I read her, right, I was talking to you, Jackie, about it last night, and then, and then, boom, right? Like, 100% accurate, because I'm actually worried about her. And same thing with, same thing with Prince. Like I said, I can't work with somebody's dog unless I fall in love with their dog. Even the pictures, even people I'm doing it for free, even people who, who don't follow me and say they're going to, all that kind of stuff. I'm still doing it for their dog's sake. Like that trainer is a it, it, that trainer is maybe a, a level a V three on my scale barely without treats without any mechanical brute force devices. It's such an amateur. Okay, I gotta go on because I'm I'm gonna run into two hours again. I'm so sorry. Freaking moron, that guy. Anybody, any any professional that has to use, use that says that it doesn't hurt. I would Facebook negative review him or whatever. That's a that's a, tell him to put it on himself. Like seriously, like you see the videos of people doing it, news reporters, everything. Anyways, okay. Okay, I should call this Friday Night Rants. <laughs> I gotta I gotta find humor in it because you know right. I mean, oh my gosh. Okay. He's not aggressive about everything, only in certain situations with us, and that's why I'm confused about it, right? So there's no unpredictability when it comes to Prince's behavior. There isn't unpredictability. What it is is he's waiting for the other shoe to drop, and he doesn't know how you're processing the environment for him, so you're not providing a level of protection from him, which he cannot rely on you guys because you've already proved to him that you can't be there for him when he's needing you to be. Ta-da, right? There you go. There's the answer on that. Insecurity, low self-esteem, blah, 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 abandonment issues, the other shoe to drop. 
but it does feel like he's battling uh, he's battling with feeling more endangered than feeling safe and con con confident. So the same thing I just said, that's your intuition right there. What I just said out loud and put into a gazillion, million, two hours worth of words, that's what it is right there. Your intuition right there, Sarah, you already know. You just needed someone to kind of tell you what specifics they were. We just want to help him give him the life he deserves. It breaks my heart to see him. Yeah, well, I don't even know Prince, and I'm... Uh, the trainers and yeah. okay, all right. So uh, and then we have the pictures. Okay, um, I'm gonna let you go because I know it's probably uh, what is it now? It's almost what one thirty for you there. So we started like a, an hour and a half on this. Um, actually, you know, Amy, if you have a quick question, go ahead and put it on. I apologize, Amy. Um, if you're still there. So, uh, Amy, uh, uh um, Sarah. Uh, you know, you can feel free to respond back, respond back in the same post in our, in my closed group about that. If you want to put some extra uh, current pictures on, you can, etc. Um, you know, do whatever you want and then we'll, we'll, we'll revisit it. Uh, the first thing I would do more than anything else right now is change the tone of your voice. Okay. Here's the first thing. There's a baby step, baby, 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 baby step. Change the tone of your voice. Bring it high pitched. Everyone who knows me, anyone who knows me, I talk about voice key, right? The tone of voice that your dog knows. I don't even know what he's like. I don't know what he sounds like, blah, blah, blah. I know. No, I just want to know what to do. Do I start socializing? Don't, don't socialize them at this point. You don't need to. You're building, rebuilding a very fragile bond because he's never going to trust you for a very long time. And when I say very long time, because everybody wants things done right away because it's Social media, instant gratification. I sent my text. How come she hasn't responded back or he hasn't replied? So when I talk about a long time, I'm talking about two months. My timeline's pretty good. My timeline's pretty good. I don't know you, so it's a little bit harder. But I'm going to say two months to gradually allow him to socialize. But in the... Okay, so just, just, just bear with me. At this point in time, the first thing I'm saying... Is change the tone of your voice and talk to him like he was a puppy again. Okay? Just stick with it. That's it. When you play with him, when you interact with him, but I mean like a, like like imagine him in the little pictures there that you have. That's him in your lap, right? So that kind of puppy talk. Not the puppy talk who like, hi, hey, man, 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 but talk to him like when you first got him as a puppy. The mothering. The mothering. The mothering tone of voice. Everything that I'm doing is working on the dog's psychological level, the psychogenetic aspect, the root of the psychology, uh, a psychological problem. Talk to him as if he was a puppy again in the same mothering tone, okay? I free range him. Free range him in the house and play it by ear. Keep him in your bedroom, right? You and your husband, keep him in your bedroom. Close the door if you need to. He might run out because he doesn't feel comfortable. Right? So leave the door open. If he runs out, then you know it's it's if he runs out, then you know he doesn't feel comfortable. And it's also there's other issues which goes back to the abandonment issues, the insecurity, low self esteem, yada 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 yada. Talk to him as a baby, mothering when you first got him, when he's six weeks old. You remember that feeling? Remember the way your voice was? It's not like you talk to him now like, hi, right? It's not. It's a different way of mothering. I don't know you. I don't even know what you look like. I actually, when you said Trinidad, I actually thought you weren't white. So um, um, uh, talk to him the same way you did when you first got him as a mother. All right? The first four words, number four was his name. And then the second line was his age. Talk to him as a mother. He's almost two years old. This is a trust issue. I talk about the codependency of humans and, anim uh, and dogs. I talk about the fact that we are our dog's parent. right? Watch some of the other episodes. Uh, they're all on YouTube, all in a playlist so you don't have to worry about it. Talk to him like when you first met him, when he was, he was a baby, right? 
I use these human terms. That mothering that you had with them. Okay? And then you can answer the question. But do that for a few days. And when you're giving him commands, do the same thing. Don't over talk to him. Like, don't talk too much to him. Just talk to him and all that stuff. Like, uh, you know... Uh, uh, in, in this video here, I don't know if you can post photos of it. I, I Maybe, maybe not. But, uh, you know, I think when people see what he looks like, what Prince looked like as a baby and as he was growing up and as he is now, their hearts are going to break. Yeah. He's like a really good kid that grows up and, you know, like I said, parents abandon him or he, they, they they disappear, they get killed or whatever, and then he goes to foster care from a good home to the foster care to the lower foster care and, the, and worse foster care. And then, you know, by the time he's 20, he's in jail, right? The, the, don't go to, and, yeah, anyways. Just, okay, so just do that. Stick with that. Go from there. And then we will revisit, and I'm more than happy. I'm going to try to find out how to do the Skype thing, because I, I, I need to video record it too, um, and, and go from there. Uh, yeah, that part's disgusting. Okay. Uh, let me go on to the next one here. If I can do that, if uh, I'm just going to answer this other part here. Uh, Maria, this is question number one. Maria said, anxiety digging, medicate or behavioral? Medication is to deal with a behavioral. Medication is to deal with the psychological issues that the dog has when the vet doesn't know what they're doing because they don't they're not trained for it, right? And the, the the science, the papers, the white papers, the reference papers out there don't know how to address it, so they say medicate the dog. And then they're using human pharmacology uh, pharmaceuticals on the dogs. It's like okay, whatever. You know, they're spending a, 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 like 3% on, on the clinical human trials as opposed to uh, on the dog trials as opposed to the human trials. The anxiety, the digging, it depends where the dog is digging in the yard. I mean, I talked to somebody else about this before already on, on one of the vlogs. So it depends where the digging is. Um, you know, uh, the it's, it's, it is a behavioral issue. And a lot of times it's either, uh, the dog is either playful, but if it's a specific area that that dog is, is digging in and where that yard in the yard they're digging... Or, or whatever, if they're out of the off-leash park and they're digging in the beach, whatever, it's just them having fun. But if they're at home and they're doing it in your property, then it's indicative of a psychological aspect, depending on why and what they're doing. They might just doing it, the, the dog might just be digging for fun, or it might be just something else that's a bit more profound. Um, um, but again, would need a little bit more detail on that. Actually, Amy, you asked the question, I don't know if you're still online, Amy. Uh, I don't know. Um, but when it comes to fear of noises and how to deal with meeting new people when skittish, it's just a it's a it's a way of building a confidence level between your dog and their humans, their parents. So that's the aspect that we want to kind of figure out on that. Uh, Amy, I'll, I'll try to get in touch with you about it a little bit on just because you come into my group and all this stuff. Yeah, you're 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 very welcome, Sarah. Okay. Uh, please share my posts and all that stuff. Please share my work. Get people to sign up to my YouTube and all that stuff. Um, but now you have a pretty good idea what's going on, okay? So I'll let you go. I know it's almost 2 o'clock for you there. Uh, thank you so much for staying up. Uh, I'm going to get going as well. Uh, I want to thank everybody who stuck with me for this full two hours or those who are going to watch it for the full two hours or two and a half hours. Uh, I, I just can't believe I went this long. But this the, for Prince, is just uh, this is just brutal. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody. Please take care. Have an incredible Friday night. I have a uh, group sessions tomorrow uh, for skittish dogs. Uh, I'm going to work on that. Uh, it's my own group aspect of it. And, um, you know, I uh, will see you tomorrow night. Bye-bye.